It's always a bit different to talk about talk in front of a lot of people. I'm used to cameras and I kind of like the cameras up there, so <laughs> that's my arena. Well, I usually call myself Eric in the English language because nobody else can when you say I'm I'm Per Eric. It's like a pear, it's not, not an apple, but so they can never pronounce it. So I usually call myself Eric. Um, and I'm a, a petrologist. I haven't done any research uh, on anything. I'm just very interested in the climate change. And as Ulf said, I did this program in 2007 when I had the opportunity to uh, be around Sweden to look at the climate change and what's gonna going to happen and what is already happening. Um, I hope I will be able to make myself understandable in the English language. Um, well, let's start. I think it was a very good presentation from Erman. Uh, it was very good. Uh, and uh, you have seen this picture from him. Uh, I'm going to also show you a lot of pictures. And if you almost fall asleep, then I'm going to beam you with this laser. <laughs> and if I beam you, you have to stand up. Well, uh, so this is from the IPCC uh, fifth assessment report, but not really, because I made this a curve, um, so it's a big difference. And this is a, you see the annual mean temperatures in the overall over pictures and um, the decadal average, like the 10-year mediums average. And what they say in the IPCC report is that, well, every decade, since well, the last three are uh, much warmer than the former ones. And that's, I guess, to meet the criticism against what's happening with the average temperature the last 15 years. As Arman said, there's something happening with the temperature. You can see a slowdown. And uh, this is what you're going to hear a lot about from the critics, that the models haven't taken care of this and what's happening. And we can't really explain it. And they do explain it in the fifth report, and they say, for the first, it might be something with the volcanoes. You got a lot more smaller volcanoes the last couple of years. You also had a um, difference in solar activities. And uh, the last thing is that you have something with distribution of heat in water and atmosphere. So they probably have more heat down in the at I in the oceans, uh, a little bit l more deep into the oceans. Like for instance, if you see an El Nino phenomena, you have a lot of warm water that heat the atmospheres, and then you get a high global temperature. And that is, for one year, that's 98 up here. You had 2005 up here, and the 2010. They were all El Nino years. And then you get a lot of heat from the oceans, and you put it up in the atmosphere. Uh, you can have La Nina, where you have colder water, so you have a colder atmosphere, and then a lot of the warm water is a little bit more down, deep in the oceans. And then you see about this year, was a La Nina year, and then in the last years, you haven't had anything. You haven't had an Anilio, and you haven't had a La Nina. It was kinda, it's kind of indifferent. And um, researchers don't know why, really. So we see what's going to happen next time we have an El, El Nino phenomena. But we don't really know when that's going to be, because we can't do forecasts for it. Um, but this is what you say, the annual mean temperatures uh, for the global. Uh, and it's, it's rising. But you, you have times when it was not rising, even though the CO2 level was rising. Like, it's been rising all along here. But you haven't had any temperature difference around here. It was kind of stabilized. And around here, it was kind of stabilized, even going down. And around here. And it's like Erman said, all the temperatures, um, when temperature rises, it doesn't rise equal. So you can have periods when it's going down and when it's going up. And I talked to a, a guy who was very much into uh, ice and ice cores and back in the, in the years, and he said, it's, it's not a big thing. You can see that in the climate all along. Like if you have a fast temperature rise, it will always be periods where it's not a rise. It might be stabilized. But uh, you will hear that from the critics, what is happening here, and it's, uh, that the IPC is not wrong. And I hope the IPC will do 
will uh, make out the statement to do more research about what is happening. So this is Sweden, the average temperature from Sweden from uh, the 1850s and then all the way along up to 2012. And you've seen all the red lines is hot years and all the cold lines is are colder years and the blue lines are the colder years. And then you have a kind of the mean temperatures from the whole this period is uh, around 3 point uh, or 4.8 degrees for the whole country. But in the last years you've seen a lot of warm years. And you can see the curve like it's actually affecting Sweden as it affects everything else. So from here from F 1850s you had about 4 and now we've been rising up to well somewhere about 5.8 or something. And that's at the same time as the average temperature in the world has been going up about 0.8 degrees. So we see a lot more rise in Sweden. And that's a little bit because we are um, we're having snow. And uh, we have a little chain reaction here. So if you need, you need cold air to get snow. And to get really cold temperatures, you need snow. So if you have hotter air, hotter temperatures, you haven't got that much snow and you can't get the real cold temperatures. So you kind of change direction, kind of. And that's what we've been seeing the last, well, 20 years maybe, that um, the abundance of snow, especially in southern parts of Sweden and even along the, the coast in, in the northern parts. Uh, so can you see the effects on mean temperature on different um, uh, different seasons? I have some of the pictures in Swedish. I'm I'm so sorry because it's it says spring up here. So here you have the spring temperatures, and you can see really see the rise in spring temperatures. It's pretty obvious uh, from the 1850s and and along. In the summer temperatures, well, you can see the rise pretty much as well. It starts around 14 and, and goes up to about 15, 16, but it also got this, the curve is uh, a little bit going down. Uh, in autumn, you also have the rise. So you have a lot of hotter autumns, so the, the last couple of maybe 10, 15 years. And then in wintertime, it looks like this. You have a lot of warm winters in the last 20 years, except for these two, not the last one, but the one before that, you had two winners that was really cold. And the interesting thing was if you read the media or read the papers, they talked about these really cold winners, that really icy winners. But if you compare them to what happened before, they're not extreme. They're extreme for this period. The last 20 years, they're really extreme, but they're not really extreme for back in the 80s and 70s, 60s, 1800s. And the same is with the ice extent, ex um, what do you say, the, the ice on the oceans. Uh, 1986 was a real ice year. The, uh, the Baltic Sea was uh, totally uh, covered with ice. That was a real extreme year. But this year, they said it was an extreme year, but it wasn't. You had the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the oceans with the in the northern parts, they were, they were icy, and you had the Baltic Sea, a little bit icy, but it wasn't really icy compared to some of the ice winds we had before. Uh, these are the days of vegetation in Sweden, and it's uh, for the southern part of Sweden. It's a number of days where for instance, grass grow, and they, they have the temperature, I think, somewhere between three and five plus degrees. I think you know more about that when vegetation start to grow. I think it's about four degrees. So they say it's a uh, vegetation, um, day of vegetation when you have four degrees, or I think it's actually average four degrees. But you start here in the 60s, and you had about 200 of these days a year. And in the last 10, 20 years, it's been going up. So you have maybe 210, something right now. 
And um, you can see that in the start of the season. So this is the start of the season, uh, and you see the, the, the dates on this one. And um, in the southern part of Sweden, that you can really see that before it was around the uh, 20th of April. But now instead you get the start of this four degrees, around maybe the 10th of April. So you can say that Sweden right now, the southern parts, have won about 10 days in the growing period. And that is till now. That is not a modeling thing, it's, it's observations. And this, the end of the season has also been changing, especially if you, if you see at these I in, the, in the 80s and 90s, when they ended around 29th of October, 28th of October. But now instead, the, the growing season goes along in November. I talked to a couple of house owners beside me. They're really angry with me because they want to put the lawn, lawn mower into the shed. They don't want to cut the grass anymore. So they ask me all the time, when can I stop cutting the grass? And I have to say, well, you have to wait at least into maybe the 10th of November, 11th of November. Then you can stop cutting it. Uh, this is for the northern parts. And... Um, they really had made a difference in the growing season or the days of vegetation. Uh, from maybe in the 60s here around 150 up till somewhere around over 165. So it's, uh, it's 15 more days every year. And then it's really because of the start of the season. It's earlier. It's much earlier. And that is also because the abundance of snow. That you haven't got any snow far in the season, and it goes away quicker. And when the sun comes, it heats up the atmosphere a lot sooner, and then you can start growing before you did before. And you haven't got the cold temperatures because you haven't got the snow. So it all changed direction again. Um, before you had maybe the 6th or 7th of May, and then right now it's somewhere around maybe the 25th of April. If I'm too fast, you can raise your hand or something. Anybody tired? I'll, I have some slides left, so I'll get you. Well, this is the end of the, uh, the, uh, the growing season. It's not really, you can't see uh, it's that it's long. It's, it's in the beginning that you are winning the growing period. Here you have, like from the 60s, it started in 10th of October, and it's, it's about the 10th of October right now. So not much difference there. It's, it's in the start of the season. The spring is coming earlier. And... Uh, you know what's happening in, in, in the nature when spring comes uh, earlier. It's uh, the insects, they come earlier. And what's happened then? The birds that come from the south, they want to feed their kids. And you get the insects before they actually come here. You probably have a problem. Because then the insects are surviving and the birds don't get the food for the kids. Kind of. So... This is what we have seen uh, in the well, last 30, 40 years. This is, a, this is the precipitation. The annual precipitation is for, uh, I think it's about 20 stations around Sweden that it's, uh, have long series from the 1850s. A lot of, of the <coughs> series, the, the weather station started around 1850 in Sweden. And um, well, you could see if you wanted that something is happening. It started around 600 millimeters a year, and then it's coming up here to somewhere around 650 or 700. And it's actually really hard to find a place in Sweden right now that have an annual precipitation that is under 600. And that was uh, not the case before. In Sweden, we get most of the precipitation on the western side, uh, the southwest especially. 
Uh, I don't know why people live in Borås. Because <laughs> um, they get a lot of precipitation. I do understand why people come from, like my place, Kalmar. Because we get a lot less. Um, but you can see it's, it's rising up to six, maybe 700, 700 something. And um, this is, uh, you can see in, in the seasons, here you have the precipitation during summer. Um, and you had a lot of rain up in the 60s. And then you had a little bit going down here in the 80s. And you, if you saw, if you remember how the temperature looked in Sweden, it was a colder, a little bit colder uh, during uh, the summers. And then uh, you had a, since then you have more precipitations uh, the last 40 or 50 years and it's rising and uh, during summer you get when it's very hot you have it's humid you uh, can have more rain in the air and some of the rain that comes in is in form of showers so you get a lot more rain in a short time and then everything gets flooded and you get the extreme events you see nowadays extreme events every year in summertime. I think uh, last summer it was uh, in Småland, for instance. They got a lot of, lot of rain. And even in, um, in the northern parts, they had, um, what was it, Hudiksvall, I think, around there. They got a couple of days of really, really a lot of rain, uh, extreme events, and they had rain for a long time. And, and um, when you're talking about extreme events, you can see ahead in the future that you probably get um, uh, different regimes in weather patterns. So you might have blockades. It's more easy to have blockades of certain weather patterns. So you might get a, a high pressure area that would sit on Sweden or Germany or every somewhere for a longer period of time. And every day is not an extreme event. But if you get maybe 10, 15 days of really hot air, then it's starting to get to be extreme. And that's the same with, for instance, precipitation. If you get one or two days of heavy precipitation, say about 10 millimeters or something, it's not a problem. But if you get that maybe in 15 days in a row, then you get 150 millimeters on this place, and that's uh, 150 liters per square meter, then you start to getting a problem. So that's what you think when you say about extreme events. It might be one day event when you get a really lot of uh, precipitation, or it might be for several days that you get a little more than usual. And then um, we've seen that the last years that we had a lot more extreme events of both kinds. This is in the more northern parts, and here you can see that you have a steady increase of, uh, of precipitation since the 1900s. Uh, no, sorry, sorry. I'm totally out of... This is the, <laughs> this is the winter time uh, for... Uh, for um, this is the precipitation in winter time, sorry. It's not uh, northern parts or southern part. Uh, then you can see in all the countries we had uh, an increase of, uh, uh, of rain or snow. And that's also because of uh, before when you had cold years, you, all you usually have this high pressure area that sits on Sweden for maybe a couple of weeks. And in a high pressure area, you don't get that much precipitation. You get the cold air from, from Russia. Sometimes you get a lot of precipitation around the eastern coast because the waters are open, they catch on, so you get a lot of um, a lot of snow around the eastern parts. But usually when it's high pressure, you don't get that much rain. But the last years, we've had more westerly winds. So you take the, the precipitation, you take the, the, the moisture from Atlantic, and you push it up Sweden, and that brings more moisture and more precipitation in the country. Uh, this is um, sea level rise around Sweden. And it might look a little bit different because it's rising. 
And in Sweden, we also have the land rise, as you know. And it's pretty big uh, north of Stockholm and, and along the coast. But here they take away the land rise. So it's just the sea level rise. So you can say for, for all the parts northern Stockholm, this is not a problem. But south of Stockholm, the sea level rise is much bigger than the land rise. So you already now have problems with some of the coastlines around Götaland, the southern parts of Sweden. Falsterbo have some problems. Uh, Österlen, it's a known place for having luxurious, uh, well, a lot of, of, of people from here to buy very expensive um, houses to have this um, nice vacation and when they come down the beach is gone. So it might be um, <coughs> a slight drop in, in prices for houses in, in Österlen in a couple of years. But here you've seen since the 1890s that the sea level has been rising. Um, for Sweden, this part is about 20, 20 something centimeters. It's not much if you see it, if it's a calm day, but when you have a storm coming, then you have this extra sea level to think about. So if you get a storm into Gothenburg nowadays, they um, might have big problems, especially if you got an extreme event with a lot of rain coming down from big lakes like Vänern, um, coming into Gothenburg, and then you have a storm coming, you have the sea pressing on, and this the, the water can't get from the city, and the, it's get flown. Or flooded, you said, not flown. The city can't fly away, sorry, <laughs> it get flooded. Um, so this was what happening right now, and now I'm just gonna show some of the, um, the forecast. And this, these are for the 2100, and there's some projections, the ones that Herman talked about, this is one uh, that is uh, called RCP 4.5, that is actually then 4.5 watts per square meters more than we have today in the radiate forcing. And that is from today. And these temperatures are actually from today. They're not taking into account the point or the one degree we've had, 1.5 degree rise in temperature we had so far. So these are the temperature rise from now. And these so that, that is uh, our RCP 4.5 is, um, is a pretty moderate climate scenario. It's, um, it's one where we, we've done a lot in the world. We've tried. We've um, maybe taken a lot away a lot of fossil fuel. We've stabilized the carbon dioxide by maybe, s maybe somewhere 2050 or 2060 or something. But still, we get a lot of, get a lot warmer, like you see here about four degrees in the northern parts and it's on the year. And uh, most of this temperature heat is probably going to be in the winter time. So the tem mean temperature in the northern part for this scenario would probably be a lot more, maybe six degrees. This is the one that uh, Erman talked and said was 8.5. This scenario we're following right now. And that is also the mean temperatures of the country. And um, you see it's a lot. Up here it's about eight, nine degrees. And for every degree, you move the climate zone in Sweden about 150 kilometers. So just on this one, you would probably move the climate zones maybe 450 kilometers. And that's why we said that the, um, the growing period in Sundsvall by 2100 is going to be the same as we have in Stockholm right now. And in this scenario, it's probably going to be, well, the growing season in Stockholm is going to be up here somewhere. And then I have another scenario, and this is uh, it's an old one. It's called S uh, e Ceres 1AB. I think it's, mm, okay. It's, it's one of the one that you talked about and said that 
this one is followed the obligations the countries have been made so far. So this is the future we are heading for right now. And um, you will probably have the same problems, but more advanced, like the ticks. Last couple of years we had ticks in the northern parts of Sweden. We haven't had that before. They move in very fast and they're in, the in almost all the, the, the valleys. And they're probably going to maybe come up in the, in the mountain areas as well. And um, in this scenario you will probably have no true you will probably have no Kalfjell, as that is, uh, what do you call it, Arctic. You will have um, forests on all the mountains in Sweden. So there will be no skiing, no hiking in mountain areas if you don't cut a lot of down a lot of trees. Uh, this is for the precipitation, the three scenarios. And you see that we in Sweden get more precipitations when it gets harder. In all the scenarios, it might be somewhere in south that we get less. But the thing is, even if we get less, this is uh, the uh, water supply, I think. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the water that runs out into the streams or that is available for farmers to take care of. Even if we get more precipitation, we get more heat, we get more evaporation, and we get a longer period of uh, growth and plants that drink water. So even if you get this more water, you also, in the end of the century, will have a problem with water. You cannot get it. Because a lot of plants have already taken it, and the ev evaporation had taken it as well. And I think I have actually one last picture. Um, and this is uh, a picture for dry soil. Days of dry soil. Um, and you can see that the days are getting uh, they're getting more and more days of dry soil in the end of the century. Also because of, of the prolonged growing season and, and the evaporation that is uh, getting higher. Yeah. I think that's about it. Now we're supposed to stop 10 to 11, I think, for some questions. <laughs>